How many of you are sick of traffic jams? Thank you. A lot of people I see. So you may be wondering when I'm talking about mobility, when I'm here to talk about energy. But you will see that the both, the both uh, subjects are linked and that we can deal with the issues of uh, mobility at the same time of the issues of issues of energy. So I'm a business developer for Ingestix for almost two years, and um, Ingestix is providing data and IT services to uh, public and private uh, entities to um, better manage their data. So I will uh, propose you to uh, talk about the open data in the energy sector through three steps. How many steps? Three. Thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, so first step will be uh, the challenges of the energy sector today, then the different solutions, and to finish the uh, future of the uh, energy sector. So the first challenge is the pollution and the carbon emissions which are, uh, which have a very strong impact on the environment. So. Now politicians are convinced about the fact that they have to do something. Uh, and actually there are a lot of things to do. In countries like China or India, the population is growing fast, the economy too, and sadly the pollution too. So it's a real question of health there. To deal with this problem, China is trying to uh, yeah, for this who like data, sorry, you can see on this map uh, open data of the air quality sensors in real time. So you can see that in China and in India the sensors are red, when in uh, Europe and uh, the US the sensors are green and yellow. Green means that the air quality is quite good. But from the red color, it means that the air quality is really bad, and the dark red means that you should even not leave your house. So to deal with that, China is trying to uh, develop the renewable energy. And China is now the first uh, biggest market of the solar, pa solar panels in uh, the world since 2030. So as you see here, by 2022, the goal is uh, to, uh, uh, to, to have a big capacity of renewable production, uh, of green energy production. And talking about India, the goal is uh, to reach the same amount of production of renewable energy as the European Union. So as we saw, renewable energy is a solution of uh, to the pollution, a part, part of the solution of the pollution uh, emissions, because in China and in India they are producing a lot of energy through coal uh, plants. But also, renewable energy are also a challenge. Yes, because you you know that nuclear power plants you can push a button, oh, it's almost that, <laughs> you push a button and you produce energy. But with your renewable energy, you have to, it depends on weather. So you can't really plan it, you have to predict it. You have to predict the production of the energy and you have to predict the consumption of energy. Also, how many of you have installed so solar panels at home? Thank you. So these people are prosumers means that they are producer, producers and consumers of energy. So also, you, the distributors and transporters of energy have to take into account this factor of local production in uh, the, their network of energy. One other challenge to this is uh, smart grids. Smart grids are in, an answer to the uh, problem of renewable energy and the pre prediction of this, but it's also a challenge because how many of you know what, is, what smart grids are? Thank you. For those who don't know, so smart grids are a network of uh, energy, energy with the sensors from the producer 
of energy to the consumer of energy. And so the, you can see that uh, there are a lot of different actors, a lot of different sensors who are emitting data, information, and the goal is to better manage the network of energy. The problem with that and the challenge here is big data. Because you can have a lot of sensors, a lot of data to inform you of the uh, actual uh, uh, network of energy, but you have to deal with all these data and all the and analyze them, which is not always the case today. And the last challenge I wanted to talk about today is the energy efficiency in buildings. Because we talked about the pollution, we talked about the production of energy, but also it, you have to manage the uh, consumption of energy. Because if you are better producing but still consuming too much, you still have a problem with uh, the... Um, it's, it's not good, I mean, you should just consume less to produce less and better. Um, so, the solutions <laughs> to these problems. Uh, the first one is, uh, so our services that we are offering in Ingestic. So the first one is the energy system, uh, information system optimization. Because as we said, the uh, smart grids are uh, uh, sending a lot of information, but we have to prepare the information system to get all this data and to be able to treat this data. Talking about treatment, treatment of the data and the analysis, we also uh, do that in Ingestic with our data scientist and data analyst. I will talk now about a project we did uh, concerning the, the second part, the analysis of the data. The project was uh, with the, a group of schools called CEGEC in Belgium. So we have a lot of different uh, buildings with the, uh, at these schools, and they wanted to better manage their energy in these buildings. The first question was, are they really consuming too much energy? So to try to answer to this question, we analyzed, I will talk now about one specific building. So in this building, we asked for the data of the, uh, the electrical data, uh, electrical consumption of the building. Then we divided this uh, number with the number of uh, students in that school. So then we were able to compare the, the consumption of electricity in that building with other buildings. On this graph, you see that the, the consumption of per student is 250 kilowatt per year. And they are finally in the average of the consumption per building in uh, this uh, group of schools. So the worst result is 650 kilowatt per student, and the best is 50 kilowatt per student in a building. On this graph, you see per day the uh, consumption uh, in black, the actual consumption per student in, in one day of school, and it's compared with the ideal consumption that a student could uh, have in that building. So we can imagine maybe that uh, once they will get out of the school and see on the TV before getting out that how many they consumed in the real time and uh, it would be compared with the same day of the last, <coughs> last year. So it could be something very interesting for the education of uh, the children. Also, there are also other graphs because we compared also these data in weekend and whole days consumption of uh, electricity. Now, uh, uh, I want to talk about uh, GRDF Open Data. So GRDF is the um, distributor of gas in France. I want to talk about this because actually in Belgium it was one of the challenges to do the project of CEGEC. Mainly, when you ask for the data of uh, consuming data of electricity and gas, it's very complicated to get them because today they have to, we have to ask to each distributor of energy and they have to do queries manually uh, to get this data. GRDF decided to create an open data platform which allows 
the sharing of data and showing the data, which is not uh, available yet in, in Belgium. But what is more interesting with that project is the cult uh, culture of the company which changed. Doing open data, they started to think, oh, maybe my data are not only mine, and it's re interesting to share this data with other uh, people. And that's why they decided to do the project GRDF Addict. Addict means Accès aux données individuelles des clients par des tiers. So it is actually the access to the individual data of the clients by ESCOs. <coughs> How many of you know what ESCOs are? Thank you. <laughs> so for this who don't know, uh, ESCOs are energy services companies. So it means the new actors on the market who are offering new services to clients like industries or schools or uh, even private people. So by signing a, a contract with an ESCO, you know that they will uh, analyze your data and then try to provide, um, to try to find solutions to um, better manage your electricity. So basically, it's what we did for the uh, project with the schools. But what is interesting is with the GRDF project uh, addict, it that with the open data thing, they decided to uh, start to share the real-time data through the API. And the API is very important for uh, ESCOs because they get the real-time data so they can really manage the, the energy consumption in real time. Another Solution is uh, another open data platform because we are here to talk about this. So it's Enedis. Enedis is the uh, general uh, distributor of energy electricity in France. And very often we hear that, uh, okay, I'm putting my data on the open data platform, but finally I don't really know what people are doing with that. So now we talk about Energisimo, which is uh, a startup who decided to help the cities to better uh, manage uh, their energy and also to uh, give some recommendations on how to improve this. So for example, here I wrote Nantes, which is a city in France, and thanks to this application, I see all the data available about the consumption of electricity and the production also. Then I can see here other cities which are which have the similar uh, data to Nantes, so for example, Orléans, so you can compare again the cities. But the most interesting part are the recommendations. So Energisimo is providing recommendations in comparison with other cities, uh, geographically uh, similar and with weather data, and also the data in, in energy. And here, for example, they provide to develop the solar panels uh, in that city and also biogas production. Talking about biogas, France has a very uh, high goal because by 2030, they uh, want to produce 30% of the gas consumed by biomethanization. So it's a lot, but you can see that thanks to that platform, it can help them to uh, implement the goals they are deciding, deciding nationally to these specific regions. So it's also a good argument for uh, politics. Another application who was uh, created thanks to uh, open data and trans transporter open data is electricity map. So here on this map, you can see the production of electricity in real time with the emission of uh, uh, carbon emissions. And you can see that, for example, here in France or in Finland, they are producing electricity with low carbon emissions. Whereas in uh, Poland, there is a very high uh, carbon emission because they are mostly producing with coal uh, plants. We also see, again, in real time, the flows of wind there. So you can use it to predict the, the production through uh, wind turbines. Mm -hmm. 
I like this map because it's quite new. Before, with, without open data, we were not able to see that. And here it's very concrete that, yeah, yes, we are producing, the flows are here, and there are different colors. Here we can do better, and you can have, you can change the politics. Well, what are the meanings of the different colors of the conference? <coughs> uh, it's about the carbon emissions. So if you're green, it means that you're quite, so it's not the real website, <laughs> it was just a GIF, but here you have the different, um, proportions of, uh, of uh, carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. And so more dark the color is, it means that you are emitting most, mm, more uh, carbon. Uh, where can we find this website? It's called Electricity Map. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. There is also another application, I didn't notice that, but you can see the real um, w uh, wind flows in real time, and you can uh, move the, the planet, and it was uh, made to prove that you have more, uh, a stronger winds in the seas than on the on Earth, so that maybe we should do more offshore wind uh, production. Now, I will talk another about another open data platform, which, which was made by Angie. I wanted to talk about Angie because Angie is a private uh, company, is, they are a producer of energy, and so sharing data for public entities it's complicated, but for private companies it's even more complicated. Because here they share the data of their uh, wind turbine production, so it was about four wind turbines, but it's a good beginning. And uh, because Angie has a problem, when they install a wind turbine, they expect a lifetime of 20 years. But also they want to produce the most energy possible with the wind turbine. And they need to find a good way to produce a lot without uh, damaging the lifetime of the wind turbine. So they put it, the data on the open data platform and they are now organizing a hackathon <coughs> and a competition with uh, French schools to work on it. The good surprise <laughs> on the project is a startup who calculated the theoretical age of the uh, wind turbines. Thanks to the data available on the uh, open data platform, they find a way, I don't know the details, but they find a way to calculate the theoretical age. Then they contacted Angie, and they compared the theoretical age with the real age. And now they are working to find the reasons of the difference between these uh, ages. So really, even for uh, private companies, sharing data can be an opportunity to find business, uh, value and business, yeah. So, as you can see, Investing is very convinced by open data, and that's why we developed a, a service which is called Data for Sharing. In, we have four steps there. The first one is the analysis of the data available in the IT systems. Because very often people, uh, I heard someone before who told that very often people are sharing the data that are not interesting. And very often I think that uh, people don't know that they have interesting data they, that they could share. So we are doing that for them. Then an important point is the legal uh, analysis of the data. Because also very often the public entities and private entities are not sharing the data because they are just scared. We talk now about the GDPR, pers uh, personal data. It's a real issue that we have to manage. And you can do uh, data sharing if you really know what you can share, what you have to anonymize, what you have to aggregate, and to, uh, to do that. The other important point is that you cannot just put data, static data, and wait. You have to go through uh, in the direction of real-time data because this is interesting. This can help the uh, ESCOs, for example, to better do their job. So we are adapting the IT system of the companies to automating the data export and go to the real-time data. And finally, we are organizing a hackathon and competition with schools. So next year, it will be with Ekam School in uh, Brussels. 
So, have you enough energy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because we are talking about energy, so I need energy here. Um, because now I want to talk with you about the future. Uh, and to talk about the future, I need your imagination. Uh, because I'd like to do that with you all together. So, imagine. You finished your work, your, uh, your, your, your day is over, and you, go, you want to go back home. You go to your electric car and you turn on the engine. Then you see that you have 60% of the battery charge. So, you want to go the fastest way at home, so you, put, uh, you turn on ways to find the fastest way to go back home. You start driving and after a few minutes, a car accident happens on your road and uh, you will be 20 minutes delayed on the uh, uh, estimated time arrival. But at the same time, Waze got the information that there is a charging station in 500 meters and that there are five spots available there. And if you stay 20 minutes at the charging station, you will charge your battery until 90% for 50 cents of, uh, for 50 cents. Because actually, at the same time, Waze get, got the information that there is a peak of production of energy, not enough consumption, and the suppliers are changing the price of the uh, electricity. How many of you would stop? <laughs> Thank you. I would stop too at the charging station because in 20 minutes you can watch an episode on Netflix or to go to the uh, uh, co-working space for example and then you go back home you are relaxed and you can enjoy your time because you have more battery charge and uh, you are relaxed also by stopping uh, to the charging station there is less car on the road so you have less uh, traffic jams so to realize that project there are some data needed we need six, types of different, uh, six different types of data. The car producer data, geographical data, <coughs> localization of the charging stations and uh, available spots there, energy network data, and energy suppliers data. So I, I wanted to talk about this project, so to show first that you can ma manage the issues of mobility and energy together, but also that to do that, to do some uh, interesting applications, you really need a maximum of data sharing. And it can be open or not open. You can have rights because there are also personal data uh, issues. But it's a real uh, solution. And just to finish, as we saw, open data is the basis. And it drives innovations. And thanks to innovation, we can offer best services which could uh, conduct to uh, less pollution. But nothing is possible if you don't first adapt the IT systems. And for this, we can uh, support this uh, activity. I just want to make a comment on that last yeah. one. It's not the future. Apparently, in New York, there's a neighborhood that has already done this on the blockchain. So all the solar panels, they allow to charge, but it's a trusted node. So it's not open mm. for the people in the network because they share in the lead how much they consume, use, and how much they want to charge in their cars or give back to the grid. Yeah. So blockchain is really interesting for the energy sector yeah. because there are so many possibilities. Also with the charging stations, because we also have the ma to manage the flexibility, it's called. So like, uh, I will uh, use my car, the, char the battery of my car, as a, a, char uh, as a battery, right? So if there is a peak of production and not <coughs> enough consumption, then you can charge the batteries. But if there is a lack of electricity on the network, you can use the batteries which are uh, on, the, on the network. So it's very interesting, but also then you uh, use the ba ba batteries, and so the lifetime of the batteries are less. And blockchain is very interesting to manage all these uh, issues. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you for this deep dive. <laughs> yeah.